you need the data first, right? I mean, you can't you can't drive a, a data driven model without the data, right? From Toronto, Phantom Media presents the Not So Corporate Podcast. Hello, hello, hello. How you doing? My name's Mark Drager, and I'm the host of the Not So Corporate Podcast. First of all, we haven't been on in a little while, but we're back for now. You're never quite sure what we're going to do, but I'm joined here in studio <laughs> with uh, a new member of the team, Mr. <laughs> Michael Gardash. I was going to say Michael Shannon, but uh, if anyone's familiar with the actor Michael Shannon, he looks somewhat like him. So hello, Michael Gardash. Hello. <laughs> so a man much. of few words, which is perfect for the podcasting uh, medium. It's great. Yeah. And that voice you hear over there is Lucy, L- Lucy. Louis Lucy Viz- Lou Vazenios. Louis Vazenios. How's it going, Louis? I'm good. I'm good. So um, what's going on? What are we going to talk about this week, guys? <laughs> Looks like we're going to talk about... Um, Analytics. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I couldn't even think of the subject. Yeah. So hey. what, you know, it's, so it's funny because, uh, you know, we had the, um, for our American friends, they had Independence Day. We had our, we had uh, our, our national holiday, uh, Canada Day on, on July 1st. Right. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that that was the last week we released a podcast. So it was right. It was like, it went, it went out around Canada Day. It was, because yeah. Because I was on vacation. Mm-hmm. And then things were super, super crazy when we got back. Um, and then they were crazy last week. So there was like this little bit of a window where we didn't release anything. And let me tell you guys, the, uh, the, the audience was screaming for more. Is that what you're <laughs> going to tell us or is that the truth? Do you believe it? Uh. I did believe it in the moment. <laughs> now I don't know. Anyway, so we, uh, we took a little bit of a break because to be honest, um, you know, you, sometimes we're like, we're, we're getting close to 50 episodes and sometimes you run out of things to talk about. Which I know I, people might find surprising because I talk a lot, but sometimes you just don't have anything to talk about. But but we were we were kicking ideas around, and we thought, you know what? Why don't you ask me a question, Louis? Back in, I think it was like February or January, we were talking about the direction the industry is going, and what we need to do as a firm to stay ahead. I did. And yeah. you said, well, what are we doing? And you threw the gauntlet down, and I said, I can't get into it now. That's remember, right. Do you remember? I, do you yeah, remember? I remember that. I yeah, I remember what I ate that day. Because <laughs> I eat the same thing every day. Yeah. Do you remember me sidestepping the question? Well, yeah, you did. Today, are you going to answer that question today? Well, we're going to talk a bit oh, about okay. it, mostly right. because uh, Michael's here, and and he's a newer member on the team, mostly because. Um, well, Michael, what do you do for a living? What's 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 your what job here? So here at Fanta, I'm the optimizer. The optimizer. <laughs> the optimizer. Michael Shannon, the optimizer. <laughs> so I'm in charge of data and analytics and making sure that what we're doing is being tracked and is accountable and does what it's supposed to be doing. Yes. Okay, so what is that? I don't, you know, I... Those are all words. I, I yeah. still... He's been here for like three months <laughs> and I still don't really know what he does, but I know he does it well because we've been busier. <laughs> <laughs> so... Great. So... What I do is I take, like if you look at Fanta as a web property, I take the amount of content that we have on the site and I make sure that from a search engine point of view that it's optimized so that it's easier to find, it's easier to identify and it's friendly. And when people are looking for the words that we want to be found for, we're showing up. And it's, you do it through uh, changes in monitoring and progress over time. And I'm doing that at all the content levels. So if you look at the different uh, blog content we have or videos that we have or ads that we're running, we're looking at how do we shape those in a way that they match up with the audience that we want. So we're going to get into it in a second, a bit of a longer conversation. Mm. But the reason why we want to talk about analytics and the reason why I couldn't answer the question back then, but I feel a little bit more confident answering the question now about what way the industry is going, mm-hmm. is because uh, for us, our big move has been to help our clients make data-driven decisions, what we call data-driven decision-making. Right. Um, And so more and more and more uh, marketing and the industry has moved away from does it feel good or not to does it work or not, right? right? ROI, right? Like those are buzzwords people will throw out. Like, does it give me a return on my investment? How do you prove ROI? There are all these questions 
that as marketers we have and you need data to back it up and I'm not a data guy. And so um, the reason why I think analytics is interesting to talk about today is because I'll look at it, I look at it more from like a, hey, I have this question. I don't know what the answer is. Go find the answer to me. The reason why Michael's here full time and why more and more people in marketing are considering it and why I don't think it's crazy for a video focused firm, video production company to have someone handle analytics and um, reporting and uh, digital marketing managing and things like that. Well, I don't think that's a crazy thing to do. I think we will. I think it'll well, make an interesting conversation. Well, that's but that's what it is, right? Like, because I remember when when I was in video, mainly in like the wedding space, we we did marketing. We did like print marketing, and we went to trade shows, and we did this, and we did that. And that's essentially what you're doing, right? I mean, that's kind of what you're doing here. Like you're. Well, let's get in the conversation. Okay. All right. Now. So I think Louis, where you were jumping off, I think that was a really interesting point. I'm not sure if if it was if I'm going the direction you were saying or not, but like you know, they were still producing marketing content years ago. We were still doing good work, and everyone was was still making decisions. But it was like almost in the absence of data, like like what were we doing back then and why can't we still get away with it now? So I would say now what's happening is that we have plans that we're questioning much more and we want to know what's happening with the dollars that we're spending. So in the past, it was good enough to say, I have a marketing budget and I've decided the things that I'm going to do with it. So you would have companies that would look at, you know, traditionally in the, we would attend trade shows, we would do print ads, we would have some assigned for online. But as that budget becomes more competitive and the marketplace is challenged, you don't know which part of the budget is producing the best customers in return for you. So you're looking for ways to measure so that you can answer questions like, should I be attending this trade show? If there are three different trade shows I can go to, which is the best one for me to put my dollars behind? If I Should I just be investing more online oh, okay. and eliminating stuff like yellow pages right. or uh, different components of your budget overall? So you're not necessarily getting rid of those traditional methods you're using this new model to see if they're actually working. Yeah, I mean, one of the big challenges is looking at how do you measure everything all in one place so that you can evaluate something that was maybe an older uh, form right. and say, like a trade show, which doesn't have the exact same level of measurement as you could with website traffic mm -hmm. and say, like, I can't just turn trade shows off because they could very well be your best source of high paying customers. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, for for a lot of companies, it still is kind of the way you get business, and yeah, the the thing is, like marketing has always been, um, has always been like control of creative, control of brand, helping sales get more sales. Like if you think about right. just any kind of company, it's like, well, we need to market. We want more leads. Yeah. We want more sales. Yeah. Um, we need to make sure we maintain our brand and put our feeling out there. Right. But but that means that marketers and organizations are essentially. Um, just chiefs of making like should we go left or go right decisions right they hire an agency the agency comes up with creative ideas that marketer in charge of it is basically saying like hey i think this creative idea is best for our company but but no one kind of in that conversation unless the agency is doing it for the client or the client has the in-house capabilities but no one is is saying like hey is this the best strategic use of dollars and do we have a start date and a stop date and, and how are we going to prove that it works or not? So, so you'll ask most, this is, I'm going back to older school people, yeah. but you, you'll ask most marketers and say, you know, should we do a trade show or not for a given example? Should we do a trade show or not? The truth is you don't know if you should do a trade show or not until you do a trade show. But yeah, most people right. then don't set up the analytics required to prove if the second trade show is valid or not. Right. So that's interesting. So yeah. should we do a trade show or not? Right. I don't know. How much will it cost to do the trade show? $20,000. Right. right. Okay. Do we even want to spend 20000 on this or not? Yes, we do. Okay. If we do, do we want to spend the extra few thousand or do we want to take the extra effort to track to make sure that that 20000 spend is, should, should it maybe be 50000 Should we be doing three trade shows a year because the first one was so good? But you won't know until you, you start the pilot. Should right. we go into a new geography? Yeah, no, you're right. Right? I don't know if we should go into a new geography yeah. until you set up your, you know, well, it'll cost $12,000 to go into a new geography. And it'll take three months to prove if we, if we can sell anything there. 
Right. Great. Great. Yeah. So that's that's yeah, yeah. what we're going to do. But you know, for the trade show example, it's like people talk about about you know, well, what? Do you, how do you track stuff in a trade show? Right. Like how how do you know if you're getting sales or not? Well, it's like you can do a combination of online and offline activities. You can have someone be paid minimum wage to sit with a clicker and literally just sit there the whole day and track everyone who walks by, uh, track every, like do a, a tick for everyone who steps into the booth right. and do a tick for everyone who has a conversation right. and that's their job. And then, so now you know, okay, at this trade show, we had 1,200 people walk by, we had, uh, we had 40 people step in and we had three conversations. That's not a good use of spend. No. I mean, no. unless you're selling like really expensive stuff, I'd yeah. be like, okay, great. Don't do that yeah, trade show ever again. Yeah. Right? So but but what people have been done, been doing in marketing for a long time is is, hey, we gotta do trade sh- right. It's the old school, like the oldest line in the world, right? Like half of my marketing spend doesn't work for me, but I'm just not sure which half. Right. right. Like that like I don't know who I don't know where that quote comes from, but it's like, I know half of my marketing dollars or advertising dollars aren't doing anything for me. I just don't know which half. So it's interesting how like nebulous it was or, or in certain cases it still is. It's, it's almost a bit of like fairy well, tale I mean, stuff. People still do track. Like they still do. Yeah. Large companies do research. You do research yeah. before you put your millions of dollars behind right. campaign spend. Um, you'll but, do, you'll do uh, Nielsen uh, brand. Well, I was going to say the, the Nielsen stuff, but I mean, you need the data first, right? I mean, you can't you can't drive a, a data driven model without the data, right? Right. So, so how do you? <laughs> so how do you? Right. How do you? How do you? Opt- like you just said, you have to start somewhere. You have to start with a a, a test, a pilot, right? Right. Well, but so, it, but so it's a it's a mindset. It's like we've operated for years with people coming to us saying, "I want a video," and us saying, "Well, if you're going to spend the budget, you're going to spend. Shouldn't it be an effective video, right? Like like it's not enough just." to do a video like we're going to spend money on this like why wouldn't we do make it the most effective possible and it's it for us it's the natural continuation of that mindset if you're gonna if you're gonna create uh a web-based business or a website let's let's back up if you're gonna have a business you need to have an effective online strategy for lead generation yeah some people just consider it a GoDaddy site but if you're gonna have that why wouldn't you have some level of analytics and some level of reporting. And most people just go like, well, they, there's a coding issue. Like they just don't know how to set it up. Or even if they do set it up, they don't know how to read the data, right? Like, like as much as I like to throw out things in client meetings yeah. and, and show things up like this, yeah. when, when Mike and I started talking, I was literally like, I want to be able to ask really big questions and I want him to be able to give me the answer. And that's his job. Right, like client sells X product for Y dollars and makes Z profit based off you know how many clients do we need to prove an ROI? What is the level of ROI? What is overspending? Because think about this, like in marketing, mm. if you can say you give me a dollar, Louis, or sorry, yeah, you know, you give me a dollar and I'll give you ten dollars back mm-hmm. every single time, then it's then it's like great, great, give me a hundred thousand dollars. Right, because I'm going to give you a time ten time multiple. Give me a right. million dollars. Yeah, I'm exactly. going to give you a ten time multiple. Exactly. If you're able to maintain that without too much fall off, but if you can't track, then you can't do that with clients. And if you can't do that with clients, then there's no reason for them to give you money, right? Other than their whim. So that's when you asked me a few months ago, like, where's the market going? Yeah, that's where the market's going. Okay, so it's 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 going into kind of this this space where. We, the data, the 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 data. We can make decisions based on the data, and we're in a better position now to to garner this data because everyone's connected online, and it's just easier to to make aware of like, oh, okay, this is where everyone's kind of going, and 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 you can track it easier than than it used to be, right? Than before the internet, because. What were your options back then? It was like, okay, put your name in this bucket and we'll call you and you're a lead and mm, or I mean tracking the old days was just basically based off of like market share, right? Like like McDonald's is a franchise. The indicator of top level revenue or top level profits aren't as interesting as um, single store sales, right? So if you look at a breakdown okay. of single single store sales by geography, that gives you a much better indication of what's really happening as opposed to top level revenue or profits, 
right? So if I was investing in McDonald's and I knew that single store sales was up, well, that's great because that that, that takes into a, that eliminates you know opening stores, closing stores, more market penetration, less market penetration. If if most stores have single store sales increasing, that means more people are buying, regardless of the number of units. Okay, that is like at the highest level that starts to get into what I'm talking about from a from an analytics and reporting point of view. It's just right. it's just what I think is interesting. What I think people need to be focusing on. Yes, creative. Yes, you know, making stuff look good and making stuff feel good and all those things. Yeah. But I think being able to start thinking like, how do we bring some framework of this stuff around our clients? You know, like you, you can throw any client out there, give it a few years. I mean, this is going to be commonplace. This is going to have. This is going to become like. This is going to be best practices. This is going to become a necessity. Right. Right. If I, uh, you know, like Michael, you were throwing together. Like we won't mention the client name, but we had a client who's a nonprofit who were helping create a recruitment a recruitment strategy for. And I said to Michael, I was like, you know, how do we tie in KPIs, key performance indicators? How do we tie these into this project? So someone, you know, nonprofit who wants a video to help with recruitment, recruiting staff in offline use mostly, what are the KPIs? What are we going to be able to turn to them and say, here's what's happened after 30 days, after 60 days, after 90 days? That sounds incredibly difficult. It isn't. <laughs> it isn't when we sat down. Like, I mean, I don't know if what you recommended I pitched. I can tell you what I pitched, but what did you recommend in that case? And what how did, did you pitch? Okay, so what I pitched is um, we, I, we, I, th- I think we did, did this together, but um, I, he, someone, <laughs> right, someone right. in the company said, what is every way that, what is every channel the video may be used? And we determined that it might be used on their website, which would be a cold lead. It's someone who doesn't know anything really about the role, but they're seeing it on the website. Right. Um, it may be emailed to someone in process. So someone who is in the hiring process, it may be emailed to them. It may okay. be shown to them in process. So this right. is now a pre-qualified person sitting in a room being shown to. Right. Okay. And then it may be used for internal staff, I think was the fourth. But there, there were four channels where we said, okay, four different channels, four different mindsets, people at different parts of the process. Right. We'll create the same video with four different links and provided the staff uh, maintains the purity of the, of the information, meaning, main, meaning they know to send out the right link to the right person at the right, right time, yeah. and they always use the same one and they don't wreck the information, yeah. then what we'll be able to see is, well, what is, the, what is the retention rate and view times and drop off for the cold versus the emailed in process versus the in-person versus staff? And it's not a lot of data, but it's, it's enough to be very, very, like in my case, I think that's very interesting to say, you know, it, obviously the person watching it in room is going to have a hundred percent, hundred percent retention rate because they're being forced to watch it. But right. in all of the other cases, I would really like to know what's happening. You know, do people watch twelve seconds and jump off? Like, do they get a sense? And if it's only twelve seconds, then are we saying what we need to say in those twelve seconds? Like, that's the kind of stuff that really intrigues me. Now, is that what you <laughs> is that what you remember us putting together? Yeah. And and if so, what was the mindset that led towards creating those KPIs. So I think of if a company is creating a video, they're doing it because they have a purpose or a goal for that. So I would look at one thing we want to know is when is the best time to use that video. So comparing it the way that Mark is saying, where you can divide it up and measure how much was used at each time is good. From there, you could say there's a different purpose actually for that video in each of the four steps, right? Because one of them is just to get the person, the initial, the cold person interested enough to make that initial contact or connection. So maybe a shorter video works there. Oh, interesting. Right? Okay, so you're, you're actually fashioning it to the different sectors. That right. Are- so if we did what Mark said and we found that people only watched about 12 seconds, the next question to ask is, do they watch 12 seconds and leave and abandon or do they right. watch 12 seconds and progress? Because what you want to do is produce 12 seconds that gets them to progress. Right. Right. And See, there's an interesting thing there, which, is, yeah. which has shaped my thinking, what Michael brought in, is, the, is I used to look at it as how do we 
get them to watch 12 seconds and then get them to 13 seconds is the benefit 14 15 16 increasing increasing so watch length it, time the, okay. is right. is the goal right. what michael's saying there isn't that increasing is the goal it's just if they only watch 12 seconds but it helps them emotionally get to the next step of the process then we should not care that they don't watch the 13th or 14th second right yeah. so success isn't wow let's have them watch more it's fine that they only watch 12 seconds if the 12 seconds get them to the next step of the process. That, that blows my mind. That blows my mind, too, because, <laughs> because the, it really calls into question what, uh, subjectively, why is this video good, right? And, and, and how much of the creative quality of the video is actually important. Right. It, 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 so, so some of this, you know, in the background, my, my anxiety kicks in. Some of this stuff terrifies me, right? Because the further you... Because couldn't, it, you just have like, couldn't you just have like a cute puppy in the first 12 seconds to, to, to hit that, that, that emotional synapse and then you're done? Like, does it really even matter? Well, it depends. So we're going to let Mike get back to his thing Sorry, in a second. But, yeah. but this starts to lead to questions like, I believe that more examples of work are better. So our website has like 200 examples of work. Okay. Knowing that people, we I know through data that 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 mo, that most people will only watch one or two examples for 20 or 30 seconds. But I want to have 200 examples there because emotionally I want to overwhelm them with how much work we've done. So they go, oh wow, these guys have done a lot, which which you can't track for. But so it's like, hey, hit them with a wall of data. Right. Show them we've done so much. They're going to pick random things and yeah. watch random times, which I can't control, but that's fine because the data did the work. Whereas we start to get into this conversation now where Michael goes like, well, isn't it enough to hit them with four pieces of data, four examples of work? Because the four examples might be enough to give them credibility simply to call you. So why are you trying to give them 200 examples to show how great you are when four may do the yeah, exact same thing? that's interesting. Too. And then we start to go, well, is it better to have four or eight? Right. Or is it better to have 200? What's if they both achieve number? it, right. is it better? Like, what's the better thing? Right. So these are the big questions where I like the ability to say, huh, go find me an answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they call you optimizer. That's why the, they call me optimizer. Okay. The optimizer. All right. The optimizer. But, but go find me the answer. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, so, so sorry. So yeah, I, 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 I get, I geek, I geek out about this stuff a little bit, mostly cause it's, it's newer to me. You know, the, this, this, yeah. this way of thinking is still really interesting to me and I don't have to come up with the answers, which is like, you know, so you can, you can wrap you, your yeah, mind. You're like a spectator and you're just <laughs> kind of right. fascinated. I'm going to be it. like, and yeah. he'll come with an answer and halfway through I'll be like, here's five more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very, I thought you were going to tell him about the jam. Oh no! Yeah, the jamster. You, well, yeah, do, okay, sure. so do you want to go into the jam survey, so, or do you want to go into uh, answering the rest of that that question? Yeah, I feel like we're kind of all over the place. Maybe yeah, let's go, go with let's let's finish. We'll come back to yeah, jam. Yeah, let's let's uh, keep going with you were saying about okay. So twelve seconds they fall off. Yes, in the recruitment example. Right, that's the goal, right? Just get them to progress through the process. Right. So each step of the process is going to have its own end goal, right? And a lot of the steps are just to nudge them into the start of the next step. So each each time you're doing it, you can change it, right? There's no one right answer. Well, Mark was saying how many videos should we have on the website, right? And we came up with eight. We actually came up with eight for people on a desktop and four for people on a mobile because eight looks ridiculous on a mobile. So you have to think of where am I presenting this information to someone and what is their intention and what is their, their purpose at this moment? How are they going to receive what we're giving them? Because it, it's, it's all over the place now. That's the, so that's the struggle for me, right? What you're explaining right now is a very structured, uh, binary um, kind of point of, of view, right? Th this is... This, we're going to take this data and it's going to equal out to this, right? What I, what, what I struggle to wrap my head around is that how can it be such a binary, rigid, rigid structure, but yet not produce necessarily one right answer? So, so I think the easiest way it was explained to me was back in 2005. I heard Perry Marshall who's kind of one of these older kind of gurus of Google advertising. Never worked for Google, didn't own Google, okay. but um, a few months into my career uh, at, at this internet company that Michael and I both happened to work for at right. one point, um, 
I heard Perry Marshall speak. And the easiest way to that, you know, it, it taught me the foundation for most of this stuff. It's you need, you have an assumption. Okay. Right? You have an assumption. Um, you need a certain number of people to prove that assumption. So you need a, so let's say, let's use like the easiest way to say is like, okay, I have a website page. Right. I need a certain number of people to prove that the website page will lead to a phone call or not. Maybe that's 500, maybe that's 1,000, and, and you consider those viewers or impressions or whatever you want, okay. right? Uh, maybe it's a, it's a video. You know, I want the video to achieve people. land. I want them to go from YouTube to my website. Okay. How many people do I need to prove that that happens regularly? Six is not enough, right? Okay. So what's my sample size? I see. 1,000, 2,000, 10,000, whatever that number is. And... I take my 10,000 people from YouTube and I send them to my website. And if I can track how often that happens, I get a conversion rate. And that conversion rate is a percentage, 1%, 10%, which is super high, <laughs> 30%, you know, 1.5%. That's right. my base. Now I'm going to change one thing. If that one thing, when I make that change, the benchmark goes up, I now have the new benchmark to beat. Right. If it goes down... I go, shit, it went down, reverse it quick, right? right? Undo, undo that yeah, change yeah, yeah, you just yeah. made. That's split testing at okay. the end of the day, okay. right? I have a page that's red. I have a page that's blue. I take 1,000 people, 500 go to the web page, 500 go to the blue page. They're both going to have a, an action that needs to take place and I'm going to get conversion from. And one of them is going to be better than the other. Very rarely are they the same. If they're the same, then all you prove is that those two things don't matter to the people. So, so you learn something anyway. But but you're going to get a benchmark. And let's say the blue page is 1.2%. The red page is 2%. Awesome. So we're going to dump the blue page. Now we have the red page. Right. Now we're going to go to red page with a blue button and red page with an orange button. And, oh, we went from 2%, or I guess it would be red page versus red page with blue button. Oh, we yeah. went from 2% to 2.05%. Fantastic. Dump the red page. Go to red page with blue button. And so if you, so the okay. basis of this All thinking right. is very binary because yeah. it's you have a sample size with predictable with a predictable flow uh, provided that there are no uh, uh, the, there are no G, uh, 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 social issues there are no uh, um, time you know like oh over Christmas my traffic died well don't make any big okay, decisions some sort over of like Christmas. force majeure situation <laughs> right, okay. right. Okay. you know oh, oh a new competitor came into the marketplace right. well okay so maybe your old data isn't good okay. um, maybe you have year over year slowdowns at certain times like there are certain things that might you may not want to make decisions around I see. but at the end of the day you can get predictable results and you're going to try and improve those results. And that's why it's a binary thing. So, okay. so I'm going to create four versions of a video with different calls to action. I'm going to measure which call to action leads people to actually take that action. That's my benchmark. What do I do to improve the benchmark from there? That's it. You're right. just, you're just okay. always getting better. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that actually clears it up because... I mean, that's kind of how science works anyways, right? It's just... it's a, it's a you, you test something... And you get a consensus, and then it kind of becomes. But in the real. old days, like like I'm going back again, 2005, right? So like that doesn't seem like long ago. But if we talk about internet marketing going back that far, like like yeah. Google just started AdWords in 2003. Like so, Perry Marshall told the story about he was running, um, he was doing a Lord of the Rings musical or something. He was uh -huh. doing some kind of play locally, okay. And so he wrote two different titles for what he thought he'd call the play. And he created PPC ads, uh, Google ads, yep. with each of those titles and drove them to like a fan site so that way people wouldn't get mad. And he basically was able to determine uh, within like a sample size of a few hundred people which title resonated better with the audience. It's a very simple thing. It's like we all, we all have to generate titles for our content. We all have to generate copy. We all have to, like we have to generate stuff. Now, Google back then was like six cents a click. And yeah, <laughs> what, what's the average click now? $4 or probably, something? Probably, Holy cow. Probably like two to five, somewhere wow. around there. Yeah. Competitive so industries could be up to $20 a click on average. Yeah. When we were doing, we were doing a US focused motion graphic thing, and it was like $26 a click. So what, you know, so what determines that? Is there a market? Like, what, how does competition? I don't understand. Yeah. Okay. So AdWords is an auction. So the amount of people searching for a certain product. Uh, produces, let's say there's a thousand searches a day for the service you have, video production. So if there are a hundred companies in market that want to buy those thousand searches, then they'll be willing to pay more. And so as competition goes up, 
it's going to cost more. If search volume goes up, then it'll start costing less because it'll be more search inventory. Oh. So l- l- let's let's play this forward to like something like video though. Like I, I was yeah. just thinking about this, yeah. right? So so I mentioned the Perry Marshall example. He mm-hmm. he split tested uh, different titles for something to see how it works. Right. Let me throw this by you. So let's say I created two different examples of a video. I created two 45 second cuts. Yeah. And I wanted to know which one would uh, increase retention through the video. So which one would hold the audience attention yep. and which one would lead to a greater conversion like uh, a call to action to a site or something. If I went to YouTube and used TrueView and I split tested video A versus video B, would a, a good KPI be enough to say basically which one spends more money? If because because essentially you only have to pay when someone watches something, um, or per click, and at the end of the day you put up A versus B in similar geographies at the same time, um, without without having Google like lean budget towards one or the other. If you just forced every click to go left, right, you know A B A B right. A B, and one outspent the other you would essentially prove that one uh, resonates more than the other, would you not? Yes. Like, So huh. you have to agree at the beginning what you want the outcome that you're going to measure to be, right? So you have two different outcomes, which is going to be hard to measure. Okay, so one run, is retention. So you run four campaigns. Right. You, <laughs> you, you would have to, right? So, so, you, so you A, B retention, and then you A, B click through. Right. Because you might get a higher retention, but a lower click through. And at exactly. the end of the day, you might want more clicks because that might actually lead to more sales. And then you would calculate everything as a cost per outcome, right? So you'd say, okay, let's say I let each run a thousand views to keep math simple. And then you figure out how many outcomes do you get per thousand. And whichever video is performing at a better percentage rate of that, oh. that's your winner of the two. Right, but let's say you did this proactively for a client, so right. that way when they went to market with, with the actual launch, um, they were able to, to split test these and know that they're using one that is better than the other. But the only way to do that would be to... Put some spend behind it. Yeah, right? I yeah, mean, but you in, have in to... YouTube TrueView, you could do that with, what, what yeah, could prove like, that, two, three hundred bucks? So, yeah, it's a lot cheaper for, for video right now than it is for search. So the numbers we're giving you for average cost per click on search are really high because the amount of people competing yeah, in there. But YouTube's I like see. 18 cents. Yeah, the competition okay. on cents. video is low like it was in AdWords in the early days. <laughs> Lower. Interesting. And that'll change too, probably. Um. Yeah, I mean, there's a certain so so every channel, everything within the Google Display Network or within the Google Network has its own little quirks. You could do in-game advertising. I'm sure we've all seen that, right? Where sure. you're in an app and there's an in-app banner. You know, it's going to have its own um, its own benchmark for what success looks like. Just like email marketing, right? Like email right. marketing, anything over 35% open rate is pretty strong. It is really strong. Um, I shouldn't say open rate, click through rate is, is really strong. So, you know, but if you looked at Google AdWords and you said 35%, like that oh would God. be like absurd because you're, yes. you're averaging more like one, two, three, four, five percent click through okay. rate. So every channel has its own little kind of unique, um, I guess, expectations. Is that fair to say? Right. Yeah. There's just the average, average behavior that's happening in there. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Spe- so, okay. So that brings me to, to kind of a, a question here. Um, when we spoke on the podcast episode, we were talking about kind of how how we measure our like our our listenership, right? Now I'm just wondering all these distribution methods that you that you're undertaking to do all this stuff. Is there a platform that you're working with that that allows you to to kind of look at all this data? Like how, how do so how does that happen? So there are, there are platforms you could use that would be like uh, enterprise uh, business intelligence platforms that will bring in multiple sources. And um, Google have something they call Analytics 360. Microsoft have a business intelligence platform, BI. Okay. And those would do it. Companies also, like we run all of our online through Google Analytics, which is free. We can bring everything into it. We can tie it to AdWords. We can tie it to YouTube because they're all Google properties. Okay. When you get into something like the podcast, the podcast is distributed on YouTube. It's distributed on iTunes and also on what's our- SoundCloud. On SoundCloud. Right. okay. And we don't 
aggregate that data, we're not receiving all the information on the listening, uh, on the number of listens. So that becomes a different kind of challenge. And the more ways there are to measure people now, if you think of different social network, so normally you had your website, then you had your website plus your advertising, and you can get, like you own your website, you pay for your advertising, you see everything. Then you have uh, social networks where now you have behavior in them, you have advertising behavior, so now you need to bring that in and compare it because should we be buying ads on Facebook or on YouTube, right? Okay. So those are the kinds of questions that are at the tactical level get asked. Where do we put this budget? But you have to decide as well what. So you could go crazy doing this, like you could just you could just become way too detailed, way too slow, yeah, way too expensive. Yeah, there is a cost associated with answering these questions. So you have to consider whether a you know, let's let's look at the trade show example, mm-hmm. right? We can set up a way to track. Uh, conversion and prove an RI for trade show, but the client has to be willing to invest in that data. Right? They may say it's not worth it. And so when we used to start doing social stuff, um, we we've transitioned to Hootsuite. But early on, just a really easy way to track social was to um, was to leverage the Facebook insight that they give you. But as a backup, was we used Bitly for everything, which is a link short. Right. Yeah. Now we used now Bitly looks good because because certainly it's a nice short link for people to click on a Facebook post. But also, if you're signed into Bitly for free, you get a high level of analytics. You get number of clicks oh, and wow. the country, the people, and the day that the click happened. So we were using Bitly for all of our posts simply because it was the easiest, cheapest best way to just get at a very simple high level when we would put out a a post and facebook said 350 people saw this and you got uh you know we got five interactions and 18 clicks and then we go to bitly and bitly would say seven what's going on here oh yeah what's like like what we have to start to start to track things and make decisions but equally then we could start to say you know, especially as Facebook rewrote its algorithm, we could start to say, well, it's, is it better to take a, a blog post and copy and paste the link into Facebook and let it pull the photo off the blog? So I have a blog post. I take the link. I put it into Facebook, and Facebook automatically pulls the photo. Right. Or is it better for us to take the photo that's on the blog header and upload it to Facebook as a photo and write a comment and then share the link in there. Um, and so the benefits to that is Facebook pushes out into, you know, in Facebook content more. So they right. will think that you're uploading a Facebook okay. photo so more people see it. But if they click on the photo, it doesn't link through to the page. Right. So you might get more people seeing it, but you might get more fall off on the people clicking through. Hmm. Or is it... Um, uh, what would be your third option? Or is it better to move with a carousel where you're right. proactively yeah. creating more Facebook posts or more photos within your content so that way you can upload it as a carousel? You know, this plays down to video. Do you take the video and upload it to Facebook directly, but then you don't get the hit to your website? Do you take a YouTube link and upload it to Facebook directly, or do you take your YouTube link, embed it within the blog post and then take the blog post and then upload it to Facebook, taking a still frame hmm. and having the still frame be a photo. That's interesting. Which one's best, right? Yeah. So, so like, you know, you huh. might say, well, it doesn't matter, but it, it does because, yeah, because it does. content costs a lot of money, distribution costs a lot of money, and all of these little efforts really, really, really pay off. And then when a client comes to you and say, uh, does Facebook work? It's like, it can, or... It won't, right? Like, these are the things that matter as much as amazing content does. It really does. Yeah, yeah. That's the sense I'm getting. This is this is this is the future, and it, I mean, it's been the future for a long time. We're coming we're coming at it a little bit later than the really really big guys. Yeah. But us small guys need to get there uh, fast. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, daunting. Remember that article I sent out two weeks ago from Marketing Mag? Yeah, yeah. I, there, I was think a, I, there was an article. Did we talk about it on the I, last I podcast? I brought it up uh, yesterday, but I don't know if we talked about it uh, formally on the podcast. 
We may have. Anyway, there was a great article on the marketing magazine about the shift that we've seen within the agency world where agencies are working faster and faster to become consultant yeah. consultant bases, consultancies. But consultants consultancies, like large consulting yeah. companies, yeah. are buying up creative agencies. Yeah. Because everyone is racing for a limited pool. But the thing I found most interesting in there was, you know, a few years ago companies, large and small, would put the side budget and say we are going to do one creative we're going to do four creatives we're going to we're going to do you know a nice a um, nice number of, of campaigns per year and they would plan out their year and now rfps are coming through with a, a thousand deliverables you yeah. know we had a client last week we were producing these segment these profiles and um, we're producing them in a bunch of different countries i don't know uh, eight countries these different profiles and so uh, these these 22 profiles produced in eight countries was supposed to be that, 22 profiles. And then very quickly it was like, oh, we would love seven different cut downs, seven to 11 different cut downs per profile. And suddenly it went from, you know, one of the projects, one of the subsets, which was 12 profiles, went from 12 to 140 deliverables. And it's like, wow, that's that's a big change. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You're not. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. That's a huge absolutely. change because now yeah. you're managing, you're managing, uh, you know, making making sure that each cut down is appropriate, and actually exporting and uploading, managing the links, sending them off, getting approvals, getting revisions made, doing color correction, doing final sound mixes, uh, re-exporting finals, getting them to them, making sure that the naming convention's right. So it's not just it's not just as easy as just cutting out some some extra stuff. We're no. moving from like, you know, we're moving to a lot of and that's only for the twelve. I mean like we're doing yeah, I mean the the project without one ask, which makes total sense to me. Why wouldn't you give specific people at specific times in a sales channel that exact content that they want but it means now yeah. that we're producing like for the whole campaign we're producing like yeah. three or four hundred pieces of content i'm actually surprised this hasn't happened sooner it has we've tried okay. to shield you from because <laughs> okay. when you think about it if if you look at globalization as a whole this would be something that you would have jumped on yeah a while ago we're doing a we're doing a pretty cool large campaign um, that I can't really talk too much about, but I can share that that we were brought on board to target specific types of people. So we're producing right. content for really specific types of people, but each one of those contents, has, pieces of content, has um, you know the 30-second version English-French, the 15s English-French. I don't know if we're doing 10s. Um, and then photography and, and all right. those other yeah, things. Yeah. Uh, there's a different client we met with Friday mm -hmm. that we were pitching, and there are seven uh, unique 15-second spots, 15s and 10s. And then in the meeting, they're like, oh, we're also going to need 30s and a two-minute and an alternate 130. So it's like we went from just seven 15s to 15s and 10s in English and French plus 30s plus a two-minute plus a 90-second. In, in just the like, oh, I forgot to mention, yeah. right? Yeah, like, it's not, yeah. it's not, it's totally makes sense for them on as a business purpose, but from us, from our point of view, it's like, okay, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, it's like, like oh, okay, we got to do all this, okay, yeah, that's yeah. that's a bit of a shift, right? It's huge, it's it's a huge <laughs> shift, right? <laughs> I mean, it takes the number of pieces of content up, right? And we, it's not like we have exponentially more budget, so yeah. I'm, I'm both excited and terrified. <laughs> well, I mean, it just means that we have to be like just even more aware and careful about, a, you know, naming conventions and, and, and um, you know, where we put all this stuff and how it's organized. And because you're right, it's not just like one video anymore. It's, you know, potentially 120 videos that each will have some sort of feedback associated to it, oh, yeah. I would imagine. And oh, yeah. Rounds of revisions, yeah, feedback. Yeah, exactly. But it spills over, right? Most firms do this already. Um, yeah. But, you know, we do this as well to a certain degree, but it spills over to, on you know, um, additional photography. So either either portraits or um, or photography on site, but making sure that you, you have photography. Yeah, um, you need that. You have SRT files, so translate, uh, closed yeah, caption files right. for... Yeah. Uh, for Facebook or YouTube, yep. we do multilingual. 
um, you roll out gifts. You roll out specific gifts that right. are, that are still frames pulled um, in a certain order with certain titles. Um, it's it's uh, you I, know if you're thinking about yeah. campaign at a campaign level, the deliverable list goes up a lot. All right, you got to do a lot to be able to make this happen. Yeah, and by your own admission, we're doing uh, international, global work at this point. Um, but but it all comes from the desire and the need right. to be able to prove or disprove ROI. Right to be able to prove or disprove that that what we're doing um, can be benchmarked and can be improved upon. Yeah, that's the thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Mike? <laughs> Want to be like Mike? <laughs> Optimizer. Yeah, Optimizer Prime. I, I'm with Louie. I mean, there's a lot. Of, <laughs> this, this is dizzy. This is, this is a lot of process, right? This is, um, you know, from how how specific what you want to track, you have to produce content that specific as well. So it's just bound together. So, like, is it going to get to a point where I'm? So I'm sitting at home and. I mean, you know, Facebook is is listening to me, and uh, like I'm eating a bag of Cheetos. That it, so that and, exists. No, I I know, but you, wh- hold on. Do you know about the television advertising that exists through audio? I know about that. I know about a situation. My so my wife was talking to me last week about a a, a friend of hers who was on the phone with a friend who was talking about baby carriages, and. After that conversation, I spoke with, I spoke, I, I told you this, Mike. Um, after that conversation, she started getting ads about baby carriages because she had that there's, so there's a, some sort of setting in Facebook where you enable microphone and mm-hmm. she had that function on mm-hmm. and yeah. And she started getting these ads. So I'm not sure how creepy this is, but but there's a television um, advertising, a very small beta test, as far as I'm aware. But there's a television television advertising um, strategy yeah. that w- you know, obviously, multi-screen experiences is huge. People are watching TV; they have their laptop or their second telephone. screen, I believe, so, is the uh, second screen. Yeah. Sure. So, so that's the case. <laughs> the, the the ad comes on, and what do you do? You check Facebook. You do something. Your device will listen in and it will take note through a database in almost real time that you've watched a certain television commercial and it will reserve the ad to you through like the Google network or whatnot, YouTube or, or things like that. It will reserve the ad to you within like a four to six wow, second window. Oh, that is crazy. That, that's nuts. That's crazy. That's creepy as hell. <laughs> Holy cow. Right? And then this is when the privacy people start to really freak out about stuff. And I'm not sure if it's going to work or not, but but that, that's 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 the kind of level that I'm uncomfortable with, but I am more comfortable asking really big questions and then and then, you know, what what will work or won't work. So, is it safe to say um um can we predict the future with this stuff? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, what? Uh, Are you serious? Yeah, so there was <laughs> Here we go. There was a uh, uh, a famous incident where Target was able to predict. Oh, yeah. yeah, see, so Target could predict that uh, a, a teenager or a mom was expecting a baby, and so all the not, baby not marketing. Not necessarily a teenager. Yeah, you're, but you're, was you're killing the story here. Just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, it was it was Target. Yeah. Yes, and they. So this is this is more of a story of big data. Yeah. Then I mean, which spills over to being able to run analytics and be able to make decisions from people. Right. But they were able to they were able to determine based off of certain purchasing habits um, whether a woman was expecting or not. Not before she was expecting. Right. But just they knew that there were certain. Um, it's, it's not like, hey, you bought diapers, right? Like that's that's pretty. That's pretty on the nose. Yeah, it's a little yeah. bit like it's a precursor to that. So it's advertising for you're probably going to need to buy diapers in the future. Well, that's where it ended right. up. But they were able to determine based off of a certain number of analytics and buying decisions that most likely this, you know, that this woman was pregnant. Yeah. So they could start to pre, so they could start to um, pre-advertise to them. Uh, um, uh, not again, not necessarily diapers. It's too on the nose. They don't want to freak people out. But right. like uh, things like um, 
uh, redecorating a room. Things like new curtains, things like um, like hand towels and um, uh, face cloths. Um, you know, just mm. things that that home would become homey. And then they started mailing out to specific people. Um, uh, like a like a congratulations coupon book, but it but it fell apart because they started advertising to people who one didn't know that they were expecting yet, yeah, um, and they started advertising to uh, to the homes of teenage daughters where their parents would get the mail uh, and find out that their children were expecting wow. their unwed teenage daughters That's... were expecting based off of these targeted target campaign so right so that's where it starts to go a little bit on the creepy side yeah yeah <laughs> is that predicting the future or is that just really really good big data oh it's predictive data right <laughs> so how far into the future do we need to see louis you're gonna be on your couch listen, eating your doritos and mark's tv technology is gonna be listening to you knowing the exact flavor by the crunch and <laughs> crunch, crunch, it suggests that you're gonna see ads for the dip that you're lacking right now right so the, the future though is obviously algorithm based advertising Right. It's I plug in I plug yeah, in these eight thousand right. core components and these twenty two hundred uh, suggestive lines of copy and in um, in either you know running an algorithm and the computer builds it or in real time it's able to serve me based off of a certain criteria the exact things to build the ad in real time. I mean, there's no way around around the fact that um, that that will happen that that will happen for our ads. Right. right. We already have the ability through um, we already have the ability to pre write copy. Right. You know, you can you can basically now this is where Twitter's Twitter gets into trouble, right? Like when, when there was the, the, the police shooting in Dallas, right? The tragic police shooting. Yeah, and, yeah, why why'd they get in trouble? Well, because Houston uh, Dallas police tweeted a picture of a man said that there was a suspect that they were looking for. Um, and they uh, it was proven that, that was not a suspect or a man of interest. Um, and uh, they were already, Dallas police refused to take down the tweet, but people were already circulating that uh, he was not the man of interest. But okay. because the algorithm is based solely off of mm. just just like numbers, like, right. hey, how many tweets did it have? It was right. still on the front page of Twitter. Right. So someone had to manually go in and remove it um, because the algorithm was just wrong. Like I heard this other, I don't know which company was it. I don't know who it was, but someone, was it Microsoft? Maybe someone released, um, an, an, an how could the algorithm be wrong though? It wasn't wrong based on data. It was the most interesting topic at the time. Yeah. So the algorithm does what it does. So if there's a level of interest, I keep saying, Hey, you need to promote this tweet. That tweet will get promoted, which means more people see it, which means more people share it. So now this algorithm starts going like out of control Except there's no way to pull it back. There's no moral say, compass to say this is this right. is incorrect. Sure, it's just based off of interest. Right. So a company, I think it was Microsoft, but huh. I, I'm not sure, built um, an artificial um, uh, Twitter account where it would it would basically uh, go out, understand what's happening oh, yeah, in I the marketplace. Yeah. Um, and then it would also write its own tweets, but right. then learn it would learn language predictively, yeah. and it would start through, to tweet through more. tweets, right? Yeah, and within yeah. like a day or two, they had to shut it off because it became it was this racist, racist insensitive, yeah. um, because it was basically going out into this terrible atmosphere that Twitter tends to be. Yeah. It it had no moral compass, right. or, and it just became like, you know, Hitler-loving crazy guy. Yeah. And so they're like, oh, let's, so they turned it off, and they're like, let's fix this. We got to tweet, and we got to fix a few things. And then they turned it back on. And like the, like within hours, it happened again. So it was like, well, this isn't going to work. It's really messed up. So, you know, there's going to be bumps along the way. But I think that proves that Trump is a robot <laughs> <laughs> running like Twitter OS or something. <laughs> Twitter All right. <laughs> Uh, Trump. <laughs> but what I was saying is like yeah. the future will be that you basically upload assets and it builds stuff out in real time. Yeah, right. that's, that's, I mean, look, that's both interesting and, um, there's always going to be though a handcrafted farm to table movement, right? Like there's always going yeah. to be, well, I mean, I don't know about always. Are people still shooting on 35 millimeter film? Yeah, sure. Is that a thing? It, it's less of a thing, but <laughs> uh oh, 
Now I'm worried. <laughs> There's always going to be people who have to steer the ship. Let's say that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. For are those, sure. Are those people going to make creative or write algorithms? That's an interesting question. What 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 room do we have for creativity in the future? Because, I mean, the agencies that... Oh, I think plenty. I, I, yeah, I think even more. Absolutely. You think so? Absolutely. I think the way... Anytime you're 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 put up against a wall and you have un, unlimited resources, or or ease of use for something, you're always going to have an outlier that comes out and changes the game, because because we we like to battle against status quo, and we're we're not happy with just moving along, you know. We the very thing that 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 started this off is the thing that's going to carry us through it. Right, this which is love. No, which which is this 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 kind of <laughs> this um this quest for 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 um for like betterment in terms of like uh, life and 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 convenience and use and and all mm. these things. That's what technology is, right? It's just a way for us to do things faster, stronger, better, right? Faster, stronger, better. <laughs> um, I, I think a saving grace we have as firms as people producing content is there are not very many early adopters it, within yeah. corporate within the space um, I think we need to all be incredibly good at this and incredibly savvy yeah. I, think, I think we need to be very very good at this so that way we at least get there before the clients are pushing us there but the clients are going to take some time to get around to it. You know, there's still people who, who run, you know, billion dollar companies without a website, you know, or it's like a seven year old website. There's still people who build tremendous organizations without marketing. They do through relationship building or things like that. Right. Um, there's still people who, despite how successful they are, do a really bad job at this. And we're trying to help them get to the next stage. But there are a lot of people who are behind. But it can work for anyone really, right? No. No, that, that's the whole point of analytics. Okay, and you're either proving or disproving ROI. Okay, right? You have an assumption. Um, I think that we should. Um, what would be a good assumption? I think that we should uh, produce all content in Mexico and have it outsourced. Right. So, any business case like that? Let's say there were a factory. We want to move okay. to Mexico and truck things across the border and sell. Right. Any business, any any accountant, any you know CFO, or whatever. What they're going to do is they're going to say, well, what's the what's the cost of closing down our local operations and hiring there, and can we associate any kind of issues with lack of quality and potential lawsuits, and what's the cost to set up down there, and the tax advantages, and then trucking, and then what happens if fuel goes up, and right. like they're going to run the business case. Yeah, that business case can be run for anything, creative, non-creative, marketing, non-marketing, but. Until you start to run them and until you start to see how it could play out on given predictors and until you do it, you don't know. So, so you know, we thought that, you know, we have a really great motion graphics department. We do really great work. And we thought, well, we can do this anywhere in the world. And so we targeted select U.S. cities yeah, and we said we can that. do this anywhere in the world. Why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't? certain select U.S. cities want to work with us and we set up a specific campaign with a specific landing page and specific target um, a budget to be able to target that and within six weeks we generated quite a few leads and we were able to prove we were able to disprove an ROI it was costing too much to generate the leads and the leads weren't going through so then the question becomes right. is it what we're saying is it how we're saying is, is yeah. it what's on page is it the competition um are we just too expensive for the market? Like, are people not ready for us or used to right. us? What 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 are the tr factors? And then you start to look at that and you okay. make decisions from there. Okay. But you wouldn't get to that decision unless you tried. Right. That's the important thing. That's the important thing. Let's start thinking about budgets as pilots. Let's start being comfortable proving or disproving ROI. Um, and it's uncomfortable for people, you know, like it, it might be easier to get someone excited about a hundred thousand dollar video and go into producing it based off of how flashy it looks and how good it looks and how happy you make the, the client right. and then handing it to them. You know, it'll, it'll be harder to take that hundred thousand dollars and say at the end of it, we're going to learn whether it works or not. <laughs> right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's totally. I'm just like, I'm just thinking now, like 
if I had a business, because I find that people are just still very obsessed with like, 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 oh, it needs to be viral. Can you make my video viral? Is like, that still how a does thing? That That's happen? not a thing. Um, That's not a thing. Yeah, anymore. I think it still is, Mark. But you can make something go viral. Okay, so that you can look look at what Will Ferrell. What's Will Ferrell's company called? Um, uh, is it fun, it's not Funny or Die? Um, the one that does. I'm gonna look it up now. Doesn't they, he do? I thought it was Funny or Die. Is it Funny or Die that he owns? I thought he was part of it. Or yeah. I don't know if he owned so it. you know Jeff Gordon's test drive with Pepsi hidden camera thing, which was all fake. I mean, yeah. if you look still, if you, I mean, there's so many reasons to point why it's fake. They, right. they made it go viral. Right, you can. I mean, with budget, you can do anything. Okay, you can you can you can buy something to go viral. Right, right. Now, if someone wants you to make magic in a bottle and make it, you know, the next Friday by Rebecca Black, you know that that isn't perceivable. But if you want something to go, uh, you know, it's it's PR strategies. Okay, know, but but you can make it go. So so you can basically engineer any any anything here. Um, yeah, with budget. Okay. You know, Dove. Yeah. Dove's first video, the makeup thing. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah, let's yeah, go yeah. back uh, 12 years, 11 years. That makeup thing in 2005 went viral. The last few years, the vast majority of Dove videos have not gone viral. They have, they have strategically bought their way to virility, is that, is that, to, to being viral. I mean, like the one with the FBI sketch artist, amazing creative. Right. They did cut downs. They did everything right. But, yeah. they, but they bought a ton of ad space to get it started. Okay. And they had a smart PR campaign behind it. Right. So. Okay. So, so, so it, okay, but that brings me to kind of a, um, that brings me to a conundrum, which is, does the amount of money you spend on something necessarily mean it's going to be viewed by more people and quote, be quote unquote successful? I think when Mark's talking about, you can put enough money behind something to go viral, right? You're talking about what are called um, like paid advertising. Like you buy those views. Right. There's a component of viral that. So that. Is, w- sorry. So you mean like somebody in like Bangladesh clicking on a mouse? No, it, no, 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 no. It could be targeted views, by, like, you you, by placements. Yeah. You, okay. Right. Pre-roll. So. All right. You buy placements. Okay. Which guarantees it's going to be seen because it plays before the video you actually want to watch. Yeah. Right. Okay. It, and so that's like invasive, right? It right. just pushes its way into your stream. Right. And when somebody asks, do you want this video? Like, could we build a viral video? They're probably talking about earned views where they'd say, like, this video is going to be so inherently shareable that okay. I won't even have to pay to advertise it. Right. But even those types, what Mark's speaking about is, of course, that's all backed up by promoted ads and everything. So you have it pushed out to where you're trying to get past um enough people so that your share volume feels like it's naturally being shared as well, even though you're just pushing it on so many people. Okay. You know, so like a, a good, a good example is we did a campaign last winter where the goal, the, the, the marketing goal yeah. was to have a two to one ratio where every two paid placements earned us one earned placement. Oh, so one okay. earned share, one earned view. Um, now you might say, well, that means that sixty six percent of the traffic is you're paying for and thirty three percent is earned. Right. Um, that's still pretty good. You know, it's still Yeah, thirty three is, is that's we, like we didn't we yeah. didn't hit it, but I mean we were, you know, over eleven or twelve million impression or views and things like that. So it was, I mean it was a big campaign. Okay. Lots lots of eyeballs, lots of views. Right. Um, and then, you know, the more well I wouldn't say the more budget you put behind it, the harder it is to earn views. Um, it just comes down to quality of content. There's just, I mean, there's a certain magic to it too. Yeah. So you might say, so if our client came to us and said, we want something to go viral, um, but they already had a expected two to one ratio, um, is, is that viral? Or like he says, they want something where basically they create it, they kind of pat themselves on the back and then just, wait for it to spread across the world and become the latest meme and something that everyone gravitates towards. <laughs> right, yeah. So 
But with that, that was our conversation on analytics. If you have questions for us, comments, if you think we're wrong on anything, why don't you drop us an email, feedback at notsocorporatepodcast.com, or you can reach out to us on Twitter at Phantom Media. Michael, thanks for joining us for the first time today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was fun. It was fun talking about this topic. It's good times. My head's spinning still. So. Is it? Oh, yeah. You look terrified. Oh, um, I'm a, I'm, I'm a hot mess. You're right a hot now. mess. <laughs> well, <laughs> and thank you, Louie, as always. Uh, you're welcome. We look forward to talking to you guys next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> I was starting Hashtag with no specific. editing. Hashtag no, 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 no editing once we start. Okay. <laughs>